Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave. I am the founder and CEO of, of Senson. I'm conscious uh, I've got the graveyard shift here after you've all had lunch, so hopefully we'll make it uh, as interactive as possible and, and as entertaining uh, as possible as well, putting too much pressure on myself there maybe. But um, if I could just see a show of hands just in order to make this, uh, this talk as relevant as possible to you, if you work in security operations, you know, you're an analyst, you're a manager, uh, you're a security engineering team, Okay, great, awesome, thank you very much. Um, okay, can I see a raise of hands if you're then at the management, head of information security, CISO, great CIO. Okay, great, awesome, all right. So like this content then should hopefully be um, highly relevant uh, to you guys. Um, over the next um, essentially uh, 25 minutes, I've set my alarm so you'll hear it go off. Uh, if I run out of time, I'm gonna take, talk about three things in relation to resilience. I'm gonna talk about, hey, how could we simplify how we do threat detection in the first instance and why I believe that's important. I'm gonna talk about the power of how you can have real-time adaptive defense. And then I'm gonna talk about why I think it's important to democratize cybersecurity for all organizations to increase the collective security of the internet. Um, just to quickly give you a bit of an introduction to myself, I don't mind admitting I'm a bit of a weirdo. I joined the Marines when I was 18 because my mum wouldn't sign the paperwork when I was 16. Uh, I then went into our special forces when I was 23. And then after a few years, 9-11 happened and I began developing hacking techniques to help us to do surveillance uh, better. All of a sudden, uh, the UK had a geek who didn't mind to be shot at, so I was quite frankly, prostituted out to MI5, MI6, and GCHQ, doing everything from trying to technically find who get hostages abroad and bring them home on hacking into some interesting organizations. I left in 2015, ironically, because I got promoted in the military and couldn't do the cool stuff uh, anymore. And I began doing incident response for organizations, helping them out when they got hacked and to recover as quickly as possible. I found it since on in 2017. And really, I'm gonna introduce you just in two minutes uh, to sense on and what we do, because some of the terminology I'll be using throughout the talk, so if you just bear with me. So, sense is really known for bringing two technical innovations to market. The first one is known as a universal sensor, and essentially what that is, is a bit of software that installs on any device, and what it tends to do is to turn any device in your infrastructure into a security sensor in and of itself. So it does bi-directional deep packet inspection. Anything that touches your device, it's gonna see it. So it essentially develops a cybersecurity um, mesh, okay? There is no concept of a perimeter, and I'll talk about why I think that's important. And then of course, AI triangulation, which is uh, a key part of the title today. Well, what on earth is it? You would be well within your right to ask. Well, it continually assesses risk and trust for every identity, every endpoint, and network interaction. How does it? It is constantly building multiple potential attack flows in your environment to use that to assess the relative risk. Um, what are we here to do? You know, so really I founded the company, you know, being ex-military, we always need a mission, so we do, of course. And so really, how do you immediately reduce the material risk from a cyber event, help organizations recover much, quick, uh, much more quickly? And the vision of the company is to make the internet a safe place so everyone can prosper. I was joking with Patrick there, very un-British, very, it's, it's quite ambitious, it's a very un-British thing to do, but that's really why we exist. Um, like I said, I founded the company in 2017, and because we had such an ambitious vision, I had to go out and find people who had sort of experience of building large-scale cyber defense systems. So I managed to recruit uh, James Mystery, our CTO. James developed the national level cyber defense capability in the UK. Then he was flown out to New Zealand to do the exact same thing for the National Cybersecurity Center. Within two years, we're already being recognized for the invention of AI triangulation. So the Institute of Engineering and Technology named us the innovation of the year. And the Bank of America even invited me all the way out to California to speak at their tech innovation summit as they were moving to a zero trust architecture. And that was predicated of some of the breakthrough machine learning we presented at CAMLAS in Washington that year. CAMLAS is the conference for applied machine learning for information security. Uh, however, unbeknownst to us at the, uh, that time, those pesky Russians, they were uh, up to no good using solar winds to hack into nine US government departments and go unnoticed for about nine to 12 months. Uh, this wasn't a marketing exercise by any means, but it did sort of validate our approach because what the Universal Sensor does is it unifies identity, endpoint, and network interaction at the point of its inception as opposed to the back end. Uh, and therefore, the UK government invested in Sensorm because again, they realized uh, this model of 
perimeter to fence. If you do get someone on the inside in such a pernicious way, you probably don't want to be uh, caught in the cage with the bear to a certain extent, okay? So um, uh, we are a national security strategic investment fund company. And then by 2021, we were humbled for the World Economic Forum to name us a technology pioneer. Since then, we've been growing the business and we protect critical national infrastructure, both at the UK and abroad, financial services, manufacturing companies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so why is it important to be cybersecurity resilient? Why is it so hard to remain secure? Well, there's really four mega trends that we see affecting security today. The first one is complexity. You can track this with the advent of cloud services in the mid 2000s. And as opposed to having uh, the traditional perimeter defense model where you've got a castle and a moat and a, a high wall around your network, Actually, a much more uh, apt analogy today is an archipelago of data islands, each with its own attack surface, each with its own levels of risk. The threat, of course, is always evolving. In Q3 this year, we've seen 92 successful ransomware attacks in the UK. We've seen 626 successful ones in the US, okay? So these people are constantly evolving their tactics and techniques and procedures to constantly evolve. We're seeing the use of zero-day exploits after they've invested the hundreds of millions of dollars they were making per quarter from the campaigns in 2020 and 21 in order to exploit perimeter devices, etc. I'm sure if some of you are in security operations, you equally be losing some sleep because of that, uh, as well as we have. Um, exponential data. We are data geeks, okay? So many of the tools that we use today, they were built around 2012, 2013, when there was a fraction of the data being produced. By 2020, almost 200 zettabyte, uh, zettabytes of data uh, are looking to produce be produced, adopted, and consumed in the world. Just to put a mental anchor uh, after lunch in your head, if one bite was equal to one grain of rice, you could fill the Pacific Ocean with one zettabyte. Huge amounts of data, okay? And so what that means, if I am an attacker after data to extort you, there is just so much more of it out there. If I am an intelligence agency looking to get some specific data out, there is just loads more data for me to hide into, quite frankly. You know, so data is a big problem that affects our resilience today. And then finally, the talent shortage. I was humbled to be asked to host the National Technology Security Coalition when they were over from Washington just a couple of weeks ago here in London. What they are, they are a CISO body in the private sector that lobbies government and Congress in Capitol Hill for issues affecting CISOs. And one of their biggest uh, uh, sort of lobbying topics at the minute is for the workforce, okay? So we've just seen the SolarWinds CISO actually been indicted by the SEC. You've got an aging CISO population. We all work very hard. I'm actually only 23 um, and we're all burning out, okay? It's a very, very stressful job. And so again, the talent shortage is, is a huge problem. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a new standard for threat detection. What is wrong? Why are we all stressed? Uh, and overworked. Well, this is what our customers tell us. This is a typical Gartner SOC triad model. You've got some threat detection sources on your left. You go and you collect some logs. You normalize them. You fine tune. You apply some detection logic. This could be um, anyone's uh, network uh, in, uh, in like, you know, that you, you've come across. This is just an, an atypical one. Um, and our customers tell us about some interesting struggling moments that they experience with them. So the first one that they struggle with is a silo data and the time it takes to deploy the individual tools. It leads to a level of uncertainty and uncomfort uh, with regards to the levels of risk. The next one is very interesting um, in terms of the relationship between the security team, the infrastructure team, and the networking team. I know that's a deep, loving relationship that everyone treasures. Uh, actually, there's a significant amount of frustration uh, and friction between those teams. You're already beating them over the head in regards to the vulnerability management program. Now it's like, can you go to the thousand switches and the firewalls and the web proxies, and can you get me that data so I can then write some uh, normalization, fine tune ingest rules and get it into my seam. And of course, you can replace this uh, with anything. The next thing is applying detection logic. So I said I would make this interactive. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. And then I want you to raise your hand in relation to the answer to the scenario. The first scenario, it's an 11,000 person insurance company. They're paying 400K a year for data, data ingest. They've been paying 450K for a managed service to write detection logic into their um, seam. It's been going for 18 months to all the security professionals out there. Hopefully you got that data. So almost a million pounds, 18 months. R raise your hand. The question is, raise your hand if you think the number of analytics in production are above 50. 
after 18 months, 1 million pounds. Okay, load of skeptics. <laughs> Great, awesome, you're absolutely right. 36, let's try this again. 30,000 person marketing company, global, $1 million going into a scene vendor. Hope I didn't mention the last scene vendor, I've got to stay pretty neutral here. More or less than 20. Raise your hand if you think it's more than 20. Okay, no surprise, 18 actually, you know? So that is two real world examples of the Gartner Sock Visibility tri Triad and, and Purpose. And I say this with the greatest humility, the teams and the people and the examples that I'm using, they are hard workers, but the problem is security is hard. We live in a complex world, we already established that, and complicated solutions for a complex world is incredibly challenging to get right, in fact, one of the things that I'm going to uh, propose today is that we try to make our architecture simpler, not more complicated, in order to allow us to scale and to cope with the mega trends uh, that we have just talked about. Okay, so then how can we begin to, oh, actually before we do that, one more point, struggling moment from our customers. Of course, when you get the detection logic into production, very high levels of noise, high workload, and of course, you're constantly going back over some stuff. Now, people think this is a stress and a workload problem, and it is, you know? I love analysts, I am your friend, analysts. This is a workload problem, okay? And I can tell it from a mile away. I go into a call with people and they're like, and they're looking at their, their Teams chat, seeing if any alerts are coming in. I'm like, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, Dave, I've got to go, I've got to P1, you know? And so you see this from a mile off, and so it is a workload problem, but actually much more important to me is it's a risk problem as well. It's the digital equivalent of the boy that cried wolf, and it severely erodes the trust in our existing security architectures. I mentioned when I left the military and I set up my consultancy, I was teaching cyber operations to law enforcement uh, and government, and I was also moonlighting as an incident responder. Um, and inevitably, any time we would go in to do an incident response, sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East, manufacturing companies in the US, it wouldn't matter. The alerts would always be in the seam but they had just been ignored because it was the 50th, the 100th time that the per analyst had seen those SEAM alerts that particular day. And so it is a risk problem first and foremost, and then of course it is a noise and a workload problem for our per overworked analysts, okay? So that is a key struggle that we hear from our, um, from our customers, you know? Okay, so how can we help? How have we been thinking about this problem? So I mentioned at the start, we invented this thing called the universal sensor. The geeky part of it is actually a flip this on its head. As opposed to trying to unify the data at the back end in the seam, it does it at the point of creation, combines identity, endpoint, and every network, in, uh, 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 every network interaction into a single system of record. And it's got like, if you want to take a Gartner-esque uh, lens on top of this, it collects logs, it provides an EDR capability, an EPP capability, it provides deception, so honey files and honey tokens. It does NDR slash SASE capability, if you can keep up with the acronyms. As I said, I was in the military, and the only industry worse than the military for acronyms is security. Um, and of course, it also does a little bit of in-browser stuff as well, okay? So it, it is basically what we call a composable security architecture. So what it does is in software, depending on the segment, you can switch these capabilities and capabilities on, depending on what you either have or have not got deployed in any of your data islands across your estate. And so it really acts as a bit of a quarterback to your existing security stack, and it can um, seek to cover off the blind spots within that. But of course, what it allows people to do is to begin to simplify things. So if they haven't got a certain capability like EP, et cetera, well then they can just switch this on and maybe they don't have to go and, uh, and go through the process of getting that. Um, it also, because we're collecting all the data at the point of inception, prevents you from having to fall out with your mates in the infrastructure team again, and you can just keep annoying them about your vulnerability, vulnerability management program. The data that we collect um, is more detailed than your firewall logs, your web proxy logs, your, um, your logs from your switches, et cetera, and of course it's got all of the identity information and all of the endpoint information completely interlinked with that data, and it's done automatically. No configuration, no going to the different switches and the firewalls to be able to do that which then, of course, can mitigate the hard work 
and maintenance and upkeep of normalizing and fine tuning the ingest rules. Every bit of data is the same. So it could be, you know, deep from inside a VPC in your Amazon network, or it could be from your New York office, or it could be from a worker working from home. The network information is exactly the same. The endpoint information is exactly the same. So you don't have to go through the hard work of having to normalize all this data uh, yourself. Okay, so then what happens is this much wider field of view data just gets automatically sent to a cloud appliance anywhere in the world that you want it. And of course, then we can integrate with your existing security stack to try and begin to tackle the noise problem, which means that we can remove the ability to ingest into your uh, seam and having to write the fine tune and ingestion rules on that particular site as well. Now what you've got, and I'll give you some hard data on this in just a second, is a much less volume of alerts because they've been triangulated and I'll talk about how that happens in a second which means much less volume for people to investigate. You begin to restore trust in the existing security architecture because of the triangulation, which means that you don't have all of this noise coming out of the back end in the seam. Okay. We are making good progress. Okay, so benefit one, you remove the blind spots, provide ability to have uh, composable security controls dependent on the current maturity level. We allow you to basically not annoy the infrastructure team and get them annoyed with regards to picking up all of the log workload, and then most importantly, restoring trust by reducing the noise and putting it into the context of a wider field of view data. Okay, so once we get this data coming in, I've mentioned the capability of AI triangulation and how this can help improve uh, resilience. Time and time again, I am always amazed by this uh, capability's ability to pick up things that were not naturally intuitive in terms of, sequence of sequences of attacks in real world customer situations. So now we've got everything coming in, really where the power in terms of restoring trust happens is how we sequence these observations together into an attack flow in order to present not individual alerts, but sequences of alerts as cases so that when the analyst is looking at it, they've got all the context that they need to make decisions and to take immediate action with regards to that data. Um, so going from the left to the right, I mentioned deploying the universal sensor to, to make a composable security architecture, collecting the unified data, and then out of the box, there's around about 700 detections that are immediately running in your environment across this now unified data, okay, to contrast with the previous situation. For every 1,000 endpoints, we collect around about 150 gigabytes of data a day. The reason why we can collect so much data and not charge you for it is going back to James and his experience of developing large-scale cyber defense uh, platforms, we actually um, collect it, we ship it, and we store it in an encoded binary format, so not your typical JSON type format for logs, etc. So that allows us to store and analyze a much wider field of view of data. And then this could be from your Microsoft, this could be from your CrowdStrike, this could be from wherever, but we are able to hold those, uh, uh, present a context in the background of those individual alerts, which is a much wild, wider field of view, which allows the system to make smarter decisions when it comes to building the attack flow and presenting you uh, all the information that you need in terms of context of the uh, capability. Cool. All right. Let's look at some real world data. All right, these happy chappies are Boohoo. Uh, they are a public company, online fashion brand for much more fashionable people <laughs> than myself, I would add. Um, Dorian, the CISO here, is actually, since he's began working here, I work with him in government, he has turned into a much more fashionable person. Maybe I should do getting a job. So this is a snapshot over the last 30 days, 11 and a half billion signals sensed across their environment. Again, about 3,500 devices, just to give you a bit of a sense of that. Around 16,500 threats triangulated into 640 potential attack flows, okay? So presenting, uh, um, you know, being able to like sequence these uh, observations or alerts across multiple different uh, capabilities into potential attack flows. 33 cases elevated for humans to take action on. So 30 day snapshot, that's around about one a day for your analysts in comparison to the 16,000 odd alerts they would have to have previously looked at. 
and three of them were false positives, okay? We're a very data-driven organization, okay? You know, if you, you know, if you come to us and you wanna have a chat in terms of like how we do things, well, we're gonna like talk to you about data. We're gonna talk about log volume, data analytic coverage, MITRE attack coverage, et cetera. And we have and we analyze all of this data because this is the data that we use to go back around and improve the triangulation algorithm again. But what this is doing is it's restoring trust in the existing security architecture because now, it's once a day that they're intently focusing on something meaningful with broad context patterns. So, um, you know, false false yeah, great question. So, <laughs> 33 cases elevated for review, three false positives, and probably around about 20 of those were what we. So, basically, when you close a case, you get like. Uh, multiple choices, because that's what helps the system learn. So you get true positive, false positive, and benign true positive. So it's actually stuff that happened that maybe you would definitely want to know about, but actually it wasn't malicious in this particular case. Yeah. Great. Question. So that's a really good question. So the question was how many of it would be new things, okay? So this is where the benefit of this approach comes in. If I just quickly flick back to uh, to this particular slide, what is actually happening here is every single observation is getting its own score, so it is. And then the next time that you or your device comes back into the algorithm, it looks back over your existing observations. We actually have a, a database in the platform called the Experience Database, because I designed this off a white paper from the US military looking at how human analysts um, uh, actually investigate. So they see an alert, depending on their experience, they'll form a hypothesis, or oh, that could be command and control. Then they will take manual actions to confirm or deny the hypothesis, and then when they see someone else, they do it again. So every single one of these are getting scored individually, and then every time you come back in, B is added to A, C is added to B and A, these, this, these cases are getting scored uniquely as well. And we're looking at each, in terms of uniqueness for each case, that gets scored and gets presented. The, ML research that we presented at Camless was about how you explain the output of anomaly detection. And so we will tell you the reason why this is unique and weird and we'll... Is that also the GPOs or is it published? Uh, it's actually published, yeah, yeah. So if you go on the Camless website by 20, uh, 2019, you'll see, just Google Sensor and Dr. Neil Kethness. It's a unsupervised, supervised crossover method um, and we basically use SVDs to explain it. Yeah, have a look uh, and also, I'm boring enough to chat about it after as well. Sorry, what's your name, sir? Um, does it also predict uh, future trends? It's, sorry, just... Uh, future trends? Does it predict future trends? Or maybe basically now new ACDS? Okay, so in terms of detecting threats that we haven't seen before, is that the question? Okay, great question. So this is exactly where this gentleman's question comes in. Yes, so actually we do this as a managed service and one of the reports that we write, you know like one of those spider web diagrams were like, hey, in May, this is what your spider web diagram across all the tactics and techniques and might it looked like. In June, this is what it looked like. So then maybe you may have made a change in your environment and then that has somehow allowed people to get more initial access than otherwise they would do. And then, yeah, so we actually do that over time, you know, but um. If you've got more ideas around that, I'd love to like actually dig in that with you after in terms of how that could be approved. If that's if that's not as useful as you thought, and maybe you were something else in your head, I'd love to pick that up with you. Let me just check. Okay, six minutes left. Thank you, cheers, appreciate it. Okay, um, we've talked through uh, Boohoo. Um, okay, so we're we're almost at the end. So like, why do I think this is important? We, we've covered a lot of a lot of ground here, you know. Um, <laughs> it is a lot of volunteers, exactly. So, you know, we've just gone through this. And what is the problem with it, dear? Well, listen, it's complicated. Um, it's expensive. It requires lots of talented people like yourself. So the single biggest growing area of the cybersecurity market today is managed services. And the reason why is because not just is there not enough talent out there, but also the tools that we deploy that takes a lot of hard work and you need a lot of technical talent in order to manage 
feed, water, update those tools in the first place, okay? So it's complicated and expensive and it takes a lot of talent to deploy and unfortunately not everyone has the money, not everyone's got the time, and not everyone's got access to the talent to be able to do this. And so, you know, really finishing where I started off on that second slide, or yeah, the very second slide about the solar wind supply ch uh, chain attack. What we're actually seeing now out there is like threat actors like North Korea and China of course, you could ask, where does it end? They are attacking suppliers of the suppliers of the target. And in some cases, the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers of the target, you know? And so essentially, we've seen this for a very long time from people hacking into the defense industrial base. You know, people will always take the easiest route. So it's not just about third party risk, it's about fourth party risk, fifth party risk. And unless we democratize the ability for people to secure themselves in a certain way, well, that's always going to happen because this is hard, it's complicated, and it's expensive. Just another one. It looks to me that you've got something very similar to Elasticsearch with the ability to have a very short feed-stream search thing in your ontology. I call it that. Yeah. So basically, where I'm going with this is, do you feel there's a need for the shared space to be grown, caught something, maybe take it to the IETF uh, as a standard? I don't know. Yeah. In terms of the data or in terms of the... Core ontology. So mm -hmm. we've got this T5 101 variant. Yeah, the MITRE type attack um, framework. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it just feels that you've gone beyond. Well, so if the truth be told, so this is a question about the MITRE attack framework. Um, we were probably the first product to integrate that in there because the AI triangulation uh, basically needs an underpinning causal framework for the hypothesis. So, so this guy's very sharp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No Maybe there is, David. Can we should definitely take that offline, all right? Patrick. No, no. Let's say you have a organization who's been doing this for the last 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And then you come in. Uh, and then you come in and say, hi, listen, I can do this for you for a tenth of the cost, blah, blah, blah. And they go, well, great. And they implement your solution great. But I don't understand it. Well, <laughs> I mean, but, but then they're not going to go, oh, let's just go and sack everybody else. Uh, <laughs> like, no, cut, cut uh, contracts all the vendors. So you basically have both solutions running at the same time, probably in most cases that you yeah. kind of been implemented. Uh, I mean, do you see a pattern or a trend to a situation where you will become the sole provider? of the source infrastructure? Absolutely or is not. <laughs> so, so, so no, still, it's yeah. an interesting question. So are we saying, guys, bin everything and just go with sensor? Absolutely not. But what we are seeing in terms of trends is people are beginning to migrate away from these like lots of single point tools to much fewer, broader platforms just because of, of its being able to manage. We wouldn't say just use sensor, not at all. Uh, but actually we would say, try to make this as easy as possible and you bring me on to my conclusion with one minute <laughs> left on the on the clock, you know. Um, so it is the future of cybersecurity conference. What do we believe? Well, really, we believe that architectures should be much simpler. They should be much smarter in order to make them uh, more secure, you know. And that's really, hopefully, the message that I want you to walk away from this talk. Not been all your tools you sense on, but just generally in the world that we're facing, simpler, smarter, and secure is probably the way to go. I run out of time. I've got one minute left for questions. Um, but just to say, I will be at the back. Thank you very much for your involvement. And if you're interested, you give it a try. Thank you. Good.